Good afternoon. My name is Bill Huskinson. I've been living in Lindsay since June 1953 and was born in Calgary uh, October 27th, 1929. And this is part of my journey. I would like to think of it being a migration not only for myself but also for my family members and even now for my son who has gone to Calgary and been there since 1980. It's amazing when we came from Alberta in 1937 to live in a tent near Gananoque, near the St. Lawrence River. We came in suitcases and my father was a construction worker, what you call a hoisting engineer with a steam shovel. And we lived in that tent three years, winter and summer. And then we moved to the village of Lansdowne, still without a car. The grocery man in Lansdowne used to bring us our groceries once a week, which was seven or eight miles away. But it was a good time to learn some survival skills, which meant that we picked wild strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and even currants when we could find them to have for our treats in the winter time. Oh, I mustn't forget hickory nuts too. We had hickory nuts we could crack during the winter. And then for the summer, for the summer, we never had a, a, a freezer or a fridge or electricity, but we would fish when fish were coming into school in the St. Lawrence River in the marsh. And we learned how to fish progressively, I would call it. First of all, we started with a spear and then I remember a gentleman, I call him a gentleman, came with a, a rifle and he could shoot near a fish and it would turn over and float to the surface. And then because dynamite was used in rock cuts, very often there would be one hole that wouldn't explode. And so we discovered that if you took a quarter stick of dynamite and put a fuse in it and threw it out in front of you in the marsh where the school was, you would have enough fish for dinner in a couple of days. And that was, that was uh, probably a, a unique experience for a nine and ten year old, which I was at the time and we learned to swim. We learned to swim in the St. Lawrence and our young friends went with us and it was really a happy day in the summer. Happy days in the summer for us. I am pleased to have the opportunity to talk about this journey. It was, uh, it's been a very fulfilling life. I have, uh, I have entered volunteer work uh, with a passion, I'm told, in the community. And several people have recognized that. Uh, when we moved from Belleville in uh, June of 1953, I was on the railroad and had been for, uh, for three years. And uh, we came from uh, Belleville to Lindsay, because Lindsay was really a railroad hub for the region. Not many people would say that now, because there is no hub. But it was a bustling center for railroaders and the Canadian National Railroad during that time. So we moved. We didn't, my wife and I had two children, and uh, one was one and one was a month old, 
And so we uh, engaged a mover from Lindsay to move us from Belleville to Lindsay, and he charged me $50. And the taxi who brought my wife and the two kids uh, paid $35. And just the just the attitude and the uh, of the put of the mover who moved me immediately told me that Lindsay should be a good place to raise a family, and so we consequently we had four more children, and it's been a remarkable remarkable town to have people come and say this is going to be home. The railroad at 1953, we had two passenger trains a day, one that came out of Belleville to Lindsay to Toronto, and the returning <coughs> uh, train in the evening that went from Toronto to Lindsay and back to Belleville. And it was well used, it was well used. We also had a Halliburton run here that went to Halliburton every day and stayed overnight and then came back the next day. We had, uh, we had uh, stone trains coming out of Kirkfield and they were on their way to Toronto from here. We had also, we had particularly in the winter time we had the grain trains from the lakehead that came down through Lindsay to Montreal to the boats when the seaway was frozen. When Lindsay had the trains, we didn't ha have any wigwags or gates on Lindsay Street South where the tracks were. But they had a man hired by the name of Mr. Tony Bovey. And Tony had a stop sign in which he would stand out in front of the cars and stop them when the train was coming back and forth and back and forth. And it was, and then he also had a cabin that was up on stilts and he could come down those stairs and perform his duties. Those were, those were kind of strange things to see for many people who come to visit our town. But that's the way things were. They were pretty simple, but they were hustling. In 1953, Lindsay was also an industrial center. We had three or four major industries here. Union Carbide was probably one of the best known. It was also called Viscase. And they did, they employed almost 500 people and they made food casings there and I'm not too sure what else they made, but it was basically a chemical factory too. And that is a bit of a story in itself. Because some of the overflow actually washed into the Scugog River. And at times you would find up to 50 fish that would be floating after an overflow of chemicals from that factory. And then there was the uh, John Thomas's specialties. John first started out as a summer recreation in making chaises and chairs and other things. And at peak time in the spring and early summer, he would employ 450 people. And then Breakshoe, which was also an American company, made brake linings for cars, trucks, railroad, or whatever. And they employed at least 100 persons. So it was, it was a, a buzz time for this community. And I say that because it was growing, it was developing, 
and we had a number of professionals who had to come and care for people. And particularly, those people were, yes, doctors, lawyers, and other people in the helping profession. So <clears throat> the playgrounds were full of people. They were full of kids. And it was, uh, you might call, a hive of activity. And then in the fall, you couldn't forget our exhibition here, which was well known across Ontario for just not its size, but for its uh, regional attraction. It was probably one of the better known exhibi exhibitions in, in Lindsay, and it run for the full week. One of the things that, uh, when it was in the old fairgrounds, as we call it, you could hear the barkers at the exhibition hollering and talking for over half the town. So <clears throat> it was, a, for some perhaps who lived close, it was an upsetting time, but for others who lived farther away, it was a time when we just could smile. We lived here and uh, our children went to the public schools and the high schools and graduated from there to go to universities and colleges. And so those are some of the really good memories. And when we invited family or friends to come and visit, they were also amazed at the kind of kind of good, solid feelings that they could feel between people who lived there and people who visited here. And now that uh, I think I could say that now that I'm living in the twilight years, uh, we made some, my wife and family and I made some choices about how we want to live the short years after our retirement but I worked for 28 years on the fire department, and I've been retired 30 years from that vocation. It's sad to say that a lot of my compatriots who were part of that fire department scene are, are not living now. But anyway, we are, I am living here alone in this retirement home and my wife after she broke her hip here had to go to the manor for extra care and in this particular retirement home I tell people that they kill you with kindness even before you move in people have been notified or the staff have been notified of what your name is and so when you enter the door, they call you by your first name. Now that's the way that this uh, retirement residents try to make people feel, that they're welcome, that they're home. I have much more to say. It's hard to talk about uh, 90 years in 30 minutes, but uh, we, we have chosen our last resting place, Marilyn and I, and we have chosen it at Sucker Creek in the cemetery, in a, in a labyrinth there. And the one thing about it, Marilyn always wanted to have a place for a view. Wherever we visited, whether it was in Europe or New Zealand or whatever, she always had a pl place she'd like to put up her house. So this is the reason we have chosen this labyrinth out at Sucker Creek. It overlooks the Scugog. It's not the prettiest river, but it's water. And so this is where we will put our name on the face plate with our, with our birth date and 
the crest of the United Church of Canada. Thank you and have a good day.